Thank you, John. John is much taller than I am. Um, economists tell very bad jokes. Um, maybe it's because they're in jokes, but I remember my, my late husband used to have this joke. He used to say, you know, um, forecasting is very difficult, particularly when it's about the future. <laughs> and he used to fall around laughing. And he'd say, you don't think that's funny? And I said, no, I don't think that's a bit funny. Um, anyway, I will be talking in a few moments about the future, but first I wanted to talk a little bit about, about contracts. We all recognise when a political contract is broken. When British troops fired on unarmed marchers in Derry in 1972, um, the basic Hobbesian social contract was broken, that the people gave their allegiance to the government, or in his case, it would have been the king, in return for the protection of, of their lives. So a state which shot down its citizens uh, basically broke that contract and destroyed whatever respect there was for its laws. And as John Hume said, uh, from that moment on, there was never going to be a totally internal solution in the North, because the basis of acceptance for the state's authority, always fairly conditional among nationalists anyway, had been broken. And I remember when I felt um, similarly that we had broken the social democratic contract here. Social democracy, and I'm using the term perhaps fairly loosely, meaning, meaning centrist. Um, Fianna Fáil and Labour in this country would describe themselves as social democratic. Indeed, I think Sinn Féin would now. And um, Fine Gael have been sort of begrudging social democrats sometimes when they've been pulled that way by the Labour Party and indeed under John's father, um, Garrett Fitzgerald. But social democracy and the economic notion that its values inspired the social market is the political system which has survived in much of Europe and survived even despite the ravages of Thatcherism, but which is now regarded as being in danger of disappearing. The Germans are great for talking about things and for talking things out, and they were the ones who had the serious debate um, on the whole issue of where the balance lay between uh, I suppose, um, the economy and society. And they came up with, um, after all, because they were geographically stuck between the capitalist West on one side and um, on the other side, the forces of Eastern statism. The great debate they had resulted in the notion of the social market. The market would be freed up, but the state would provide a regulatory framework as well as a social safety net. And as Alexander Rousteau, one of the leading founders of the notion of social democracy, said, the social market economy must be the servant of humanity and of trans-economic values. All social, ethical, cultural, and human values are more important than the economy, yet the economy must prepare the ground for their fullest development. So, you know, render unto Caesar the, thing that, the things that are Caesar's, and, I mean, there would be certain things that... Caesar, or in this case the market would do, and certain things that God, or in this case the state, would do, except for the day that I realized that God was falling down on the job. And I knew we'd crossed a Rubicon, broken a contract, when I was sitting in the press gallery in the Dáil one day, and the then Taoiseach, uh, Bertie Ahern, it was about 2004 or five. Bertie was shaking his head sorrowfully in that sad spaniel-eyed way that he had. And he was agreeing with the questioner that the government's social housing program was not delivering. Um, the government, if you remember and you will, depended partly on developers delivering, delivering up to 20% of land zoned for residential development to meet the need for um, social housing and for affordable housing. But Developers, of course, did not want to mess up their shiny new schemes with poorer people. And indeed, some of their developments, and I particularly remember this hoarding in Dublin, some of their developments bore the advertising slogan, reassuringly expensive, meaning that no poorer people could afford to get their feet in the door of this shiny development. So they got away with offering a land swap or money to the local council. And when asked why developers were being allowed to get away with not delivering, the Taoiseach should, shook his head sadly, and he said that, unfortunately, 
the constitutional clause on property, Article 43, 1 and 2, meant that the government could not force them to deliver. We've heard about this earlier from Eddie Malloy. Now, that was a moment for the state, of course, to go and test the constitution, which actually talks about the common good being more important than individual property rights. But it was a Pontius pilot moment, if I ever saw one. Um, Bertie simply shook his head sadly, and his developer friends would be protected. It's perhaps the worst dereliction of political duty that I ever witnessed in a long lifetime as a political commentator. And the result of that, and I wrote about it at the time because I was shocked about it at the time, particularly coming from Fianna Fáil, which actually did have a fine record in terms of the provision of housing. The result was that um, of that and other housing policy failures is the homeless and the housing crisis that we have all over this country today. Kids growing up in hotel bedrooms and family hubs and doorways on streets all over this country today with homeless people lying there. The social side of the social contract was torn up. Another element of the social contract, spectacularly broken, and I'm only going to give you two examples, was in health. And I'm going to take a particular example in health of the betrayal of the social democratic contract, and that is in the area of mental health. People don't like talking about mental health. They won't come out in public evangelizing for mental health in the same way, perhaps, that they will for Parkinson's disease or for cancer or, or whatever. But the problem is that in the area of mental health, funding remains not only inadequate, it's at such a level in some areas that it is a cynical exercise in skeletal provision. Provision that is so tokenistic that in some areas it might as well not be there at all. At the end of 2016, there was a total of 1,483 vacant posts across the mental health services, taking into account vacant development posts and service needs being covered by agency staff and overtime. And Dr. Sherry McDade of Mental Health Reform said that there has been a systematic use of delayed expenditure, year in, year out, to slow down even the most inadequate resource commitments to mental health services. The Oireachtas Party Group on Mental Health said last autumn that the total allocation for mental health here was 6.4% of the overall health budget in 2016. In comparison, he said, in Britain and Canada, the proportion of funding was 13%, almost more than twice. You don't have to look too far either to see the result of this sort of inadequate funding. Sometimes it's meant that help isn't available after hours for people who looked for help before committing suicide, and I'm thinking of a particular case down in County Wexford. Sometimes it's meant that children in primary school with psychological difficulties have to wait years for a diagnosis, and in many cases, particularly perhaps with children with autism, early intervention, early diagnosis can make such an enormous difference to their lives. And their overwhelmed parents spend every waking moment wrestling with bureaucracy. The state puts barricades in their way. That's what it's like to have to depend on the public mental health system in this country. Uh, so social housing, public mental health system are just two examples of where the state fails to meet its obligations under the requirements of social democracy. Not only fails to meet its obligations, but never really setting out to meet its obligations in the first place. Add to that the context in which much of social democratic politics in this country was delivered. The European Union, uh, it was very often urging from the European Union on a number of fronts that pushed us into trying to provide the sort of social network that people need. Um, but that institution too uh, has, 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 has failed us in the fact that the social charter encouraged the scaffolding of social services to be set up the scaffolding that goes with the social market, uh, but also it was the institution that insisted that in order to save Irish and European banks, this country take on a level of debt which affects our ability to deliver adequate and enhanced social services. And yes, I know the government that came into office in 2011 did try to maintain core social welfare payments and, and, and tried very hard, and the Labour Party will tell you precisely how hard they tried on that front. But it's in the area of public services that the cutbacks caused the real damage. 
So coming to the title of our particular session this evening, wind being in our sails, etc. We have, it would seem at the moment, the economic wind in our sails, but the social contract on which social democracy is based and the political model that social democracy insists on, that has been broken as well. And when the electorate decided that they weren't grateful for the economic recovery in the last election and that they actually minded that political promises were not kept, I think a lot of government politicians were taken aback. But if you were on the doorsteps following candidates around, as I did, it was story after story of evictions, of carers being paid a pittance to do work that saved the state uh, millions of pounds every year, um, of pensioners and people on fixed income wondering how they were going to meet the increases in charges and in taxis. So what are we left with? A doll that's held to ransom by Paul Murphy and the far-left populists who are against water charges and property charges and pretend that taxing multinationals and the very wealthy will bring in enough money to pay for absolutely everything and we have Sinn Féin and Fianna Fáil dancing to their tune, which is a pity because there is and there could be a majority for social democracy and the doll, but the two big blocks who claim to believe in it, and yes, I will class Fine Gael as belonging to that grouping because it's always had Labour or Fianna Fáil to temper its more conservative elements. The two big blocks who believe in it won't come together to defend it. There is, of course, another possibility. And that is that Sinn Féin and Fianna Fáil will coalesce in government after the next election. We know that Mary Lou Macdonald has already given the word earlier this year that they would go into government even if they were not the biggest party. And, you know, when you look at the numbers, all you need seat-wise is about 12 more seats between them at the next election, or they could include in the deal the Greens, the Social Democrats, or indeed the Labour Party. And it could well happen, a Fianna Fáil Sinn Féin coalition, because it may be Micheál Martin's last chance of being Taoiseach, because he has shown too that what he fears most is leaving Sinn Féin on the opposition benches protesting at everything the government does, much safer to have them inside the tent. From Sinn Féin's point of view, it may be that they have plateaued in terms of their vote in the more deprived areas and they need to start breaking into the middle class areas where people are less impressed with parties who won't go into government. It's no coincidence, I think, if you've been watching, that other than Gerry Adams, you don't see the hard men being put forward anymore as party spokesmen. I mean, when did you last see Martin Ferris out or indeed Desi Ellis? And you know, you can learn an awful lot from watching the body language of politicians when they're together in the dole or when they're together on a discussion panel. There was a time, for instance, where Sinn Féin always walked around in pairs with their eyes cast down, a bit like nuns or seminarians. <laughs> and the, obviously to avoid um, corruption from outside influences. <laughs> I think the nuns used to call it custody of the eyes. They acknowledge politicians of other parties now in a way which they used not. Um, they've got to know people by working with them on committees, and they've been wholehearted about serving on committees. And just because he's a local man, Padraig McLaughlin, the former TD from this area, I think was an outstanding chairperson of the uh, Justice Committee, which, which he chaired. Um, Sinn Féin nowadays will even relax and share a joke. And Pierce Doherty, their very um, impressive but very serious uh, finance spokesman, Pierce, I think, doesn't any longer feel he's breaking a Republican code by smiling. <laughs> the Trotskyite left, on the other hand, will make it perfectly clear that they despise all other politicians, all of what they call the establishment press, that they're more comfortable out on the street marching than inside the parliamentary process. But mark this well, Sinn Féin is getting ready for government and it's looking at the next election. And they will be social democratic centrists when they get there. Because they're not anymore a revolutionary party, they're a party of power. The rhetoric has toned down remarkably in the last two or three years. You don't hear an awful lot, you know, about a united Ireland, particularly when they're going around the doorsteps in working class areas in Dublin. And whatever about the sound bites, they don't have any wish to frighten multinationals away with 
tax laws that are too punitive. Um, if you look at their taxing the wealthy proposals, they're, they're modest enough too, with a higher rate of tax on those earning over 100,000. They might be a neater fit for Fianna Fáil, for instance, than a grand coalition with Fine Gael would be, particularly if Fianna Fáil would be the bigger party. And where would that leave the party of social democracy, of course, the Labour Party, on the opposite, opposition benches rebuilding? It, it might suit everybody. It mightn't be the worst arrangement for the survival of social democracy. And I mean, I know that uh, Brian will have a lot to say about this later, but Fine Gael on the opposition benches are hardly going to indulge in left-wing populism. Both in government together, Fianna Fáil and Sinn Féin would have to be more conscious of maintaining streams of revenue uh, because the populism, the populism that saw the government caving in and abolishing the water charge could too easily undermine the whole economic base for social democracy unless it's checked. And that's what the trots want. They regard social democracy and its deal with capitalism as treacherous. So let's look to the future. Because um, there are so many things already starting to happen. Brexit is going to create an even greater gap between the cities, the fortune of the cities and the rural areas in this country, which I think is an enormous pity because one of the great achievements of our joining the European Union was that the country areas, and I grew up in the country, the basic standard of living in country areas rose pretty well to the standard of living of people living in the cities. Um, so in a way, the European Union was uh, quite a uniting influence, even in terms of how people in this country lived. And what I fear is that because that is the area that's going to be most exposed to Brexit, that we will see a bit of a, a, a schism between country and, and, and city. And again, it's been a fall that may suffer with its big farmer support. So, you know, they might find it, it's actually more comfortable in opposition until the Brexit deal is negotiated and rural Ireland gets over its initial shock. It could be said that Brexit will make us shift even more into a European social democratic model and away from the Anglo-American economic model which has crept into our economy. I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. The cutting taxes mantra, which came into our political dictionary with the PDs, hollowed out our tax base and, and I think led partially to our downfall. And um, we will probably, as a result of Brexit, become nearer to Bonn than Boston, and we have to stand on our own two feet in a lot of ways now that we have lost the country that probably became, maybe more in latter decades, our closest ally in Europe. Certainly, they were allies both on the tax area and also on trade. The Brits are very good on trade. They know about trade. We are going to have to find new allies and shared interests among the other 26, and it's going to be hard work. But there are bigger threats to our political system and to social democracy in particular. I worry greatly about the increasingly, uh, the increasing powerlessness of government and the state to regulate and tax the multinationals, particularly the IT giants. The power that globalization has given to capital is frightening. Look how easy it is for capitalism to hide somewhere in the ether between states. Look at the anonymity, the namelessness and placeness, placelessness of modern capitalism, the franchise model that ensures that workers don't know for whom they work, the companies registered through a network of offshore secrecy regimes so complex that even the police can't discover the beneficial owners, the tax arrangements that bamboozle government. Capitalism has found a way of not paying its fair share to states, and without that taxation to pay for the social safety net that social democracy requires, is social democracy doomed. And the remedy for that is something that will have to be done at transnational level. In the EU, yes, but particularly in the United States. If the United States isn't ready to act on this, it's going to be very, very difficult. And, you know, um, talking to economists, they would say, well, you don't always have to ta tax the corporations. You can tax the individuals to whom the corporations' profits go. But, you know, tax havens cheat us all. 
Um, we've held on to our favourable tax regime uh, for multinationals against all comers, but our short-term interests may have to give way to EU, att EU attempts to make sure that companies don't avoid tax by choosing the country with the lowest rate. The relaunched EU Common Consolidated Tax Base proposals may, as John Fitzgerald explained to me today, may only redistribute the existing tax take from the multinationals. We have to go further. We have to find ways of increasing that tax take. Otherwise, a handful of multinationals will suck up all the tax money that would make a fairer society possible. And we can't simply stand aside and let that happen. Look at my own trade, and that's probably why I'm particularly passionate um, about this. My own trade, journalism, and how it's been decimated, decimated by you know the, the greedy onward march of the social media giants. Most youngsters get their news free. They've got used now to getting their news free. And the problem there is, you know, you have to pay journalists. They have to pay their rent. They have to feed their children. But much of Facebook's news is the work of news journalists whose own media organisations are finding it very hard to pay them a decent wage. So the items that are used on Facebook, on Google or whatever, to, um, uh, to, to attract clickbait um, and from which Facebook, for instance, makes its profits, comes from traditional monitored media who are struggling because they have lost their financial base advertising to organizations like Facebook. So the sort of journalists who check their news, imagine that, journalists who check their news and try to tell the truth, will disappear and we'll all be stuck with those anonymous social media posts which really are about as reliable as the graffiti on the school lavatory walls and are, are, are deserve about, about, about the same notice. There is an answer. And it's been suggested by a number of people, including the Professor of Journalism at the University of London, Roy Greenslade, is the imposition of a levy on these social media organizations to support the sort of free monitored journalism which allows people to make informed decisions in a democracy. Why not? They're stealing our work. And please spare me billionaires like Mark Zuckerberg talking about creating a Facebook community. You know, we have communities, thank you very much. They're made up of real people, real flesh and blood people who work together and play together and look out for one another in a way that no virtual screen presence can. And a lesson we can learn from the United States and indeed the Trump victory. We need to make sure as technology progresses and we are moving enthusiastically into new industries that we don't leave the workers from the old industries behind. Renewable energy, new industries there, great. But, you know, bring the old coal workers, the turf burning workers, or at least their community with you. Retrain them for wind and wave and solar energy. And I know that a lot of the problem with unemployment in America was robotics and the fact that now there are robots to do so, so much of these work, these works. But, you know, Take this country, there's an aging population here. And people like me who are moving on, we are going to need uh, people to cut the grass, to help us with the housework, to do all the things that as we get older, we are not gonna be able to do. Things that robots can't do for us, but that people can do. And, you know, the other thing that always strikes me in this area and as I'm getting older maybe I'm very 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 conscious of it. Let's find ways for older people who own houses to free up some of the capital in their houses to pay for the services delivered by people which will let them have full lives in the community. You know don't be scrimping and saving to hand on the house to the kids. Spend the money and live a full and a good life and give gainful employment to your community. Why should the taxpayer subsidize inherited wealth? I mean, it's absolutely crazy. The way to go is to ensure that the economy works for the people, not the other way around. Um, just a small and quick thought. Somebody I was speaking to lately said, do you know how lucky you are that you have lived in a world where you have not been affected by a war? 
I mean, it's wrong to say that there are no wars. There are wars all over Africa and the Middle East. But I'm very conscious that my generation have lived in a world where there is no war. And I have no doubt that a political system which delivers a more equal result as social democracy does gives a great deal of support to the notion of a peaceful society keeps war at bay. There are lots of reasons for social democracy. It's not dead yet. The election of Macron in France is evidence of that. The German SPD party are the junior party in Germany's national government right now, um, but they're there, though we don't know what's going to happen in September. Justin Trudeau's victorious Canadian Liberal Party is social democratic in all but name. But going back to my original point, you can't break promises and contracts and expect it that somehow people won't notice. People know that the social democratic contract isn't working when they see buses carrying posters about welfare cheats in the same week that prosecutions for egregious white collar crime uh, don't succeed. They know the contract isn't working when property porn reappears again in our daily newspapers, when the property sections of the newspaper get fatter and more opulent, while according to Focus Ireland, over seven and a half thousand people are homeless. All of these things are within our power to get right. Most of them actually are problems of our own making. Don't blame the people for voting for populists and independents and against a political system that doesn't work for them. Go and fix it. Thank you.